All right, folks, uh, I am Judd Campbell. Uh, I'm filling in for Michael McConnell, who's still traveling, and really uh, delighted to welcome you to this Constitutional Law Center conversation with Stephanie Barclay. Uh, Stephanie is a professor at Georgetown Law, uh, recently at Notre Dame, as well as BYU. Uh, and she has a really interesting array of uh, experience thinking about rights, uh, litigating rights for Beckett Fund, um, and also in her capacity uh, working with religious liberty clinics at uh, NYU, uh, excuse me, at Notre Dame. Um, Is this my mic? <laughs> All right, are we are we live? Okay. What I has to have to say is much less important. So my bio was so. boring. <laughs> I'm uh, glad it was so she's about. she's litigated. Um, uh, <laughs> religious liberty claims. She's done a lot of interesting teaching work related to constitutional rights uh, at all three of the schools that I mentioned. Um, and she also has recently done, uh, and is wrapping up, I understand, a PhD at Oxford, thinking about these problems from a bit more of a jurisprudential perspective. Uh, and so um, really an ideal person to think through the problem of how we uh, conceptualize what rights are and how to think about what the limits of rights are. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie. As usual, we're going to take questions after uh, her introductory remarks. So please think about questions that you'd like to ask and then uh, come up to the mics after. Hopefully we'll have them turned up by then. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me, Jed and Morgan, for hosting everyone at the Stanford Constitutional Law Center for being such gracious hosts. Um, and thank you also to my grandmother and my uncle Chris and my friend Emily who came specially to come see me. It's nice to have some friends in the audience. I was supposed to get to be with you all last year. I think it was, was it February, Morgan. Um, and then a crazy ice storm came through the airports where I lived and I could not ice skate and the airplanes could not ice skate on the, on the runway. So I'm glad to be with you now with even better weather as it turns out. The question that I'm talking about today is uh, going to be both uh, theoretical but also normative in terms of what is the legal work that a constitutional right does. When we decide to write down in a constitution to memorialize usually some sort of private interest that we think is worth protecting, who is, what work is that doing and which branches of government are doing that work? So to think about that question, let's consider a uh, conflict in the context of rights. This is a conflict I actually was involved litigating before going into academia. But we have on one side of the highway, the highway side with a red outline, a uh, Native American sacred site. So there are tribal members, a number of different tribes, including the Yakima Nation, who have performed ceremonies at this site since time immemorial. There's an ancient stone altar there. T the tall trees, they call this the place of big, big trees. These trees are like the walls of a church for them. And they usually access the site through that uh, turn on the road, and then they'll be able to go back and perform ceremonies. The Highway Administration, the Federal Highway Administration, proposed an uh, expansion on this stress stretch of road, I believe in 2007, because they argued that it was necessary to put in a turning lane to decrease car accidents that were happening on this stretch of highway. And their proposed construction project would result in all of these trees being cut down, the burial grounds and the stilt altar being bulldozed, and the access removed. That's a proposal on the table. So if we're thinking about the conflict here, let's just assume for the sake of discussion that the constitutional right to free exercise in this hypothetical world would, in fact, protect the religious exercise of these tribal plaintiffs, their ability to continue to perform this sort of activity. That's a big assumption, but let's just assume that. How do we think about this sort of conflict between what the government wants to do and at least the prima facie protection that a constitutional right might provide to the tribal plaintiffs in this context? The received wisdom that has existed in a lot of spheres globally under the proportionality model, but as some people have described uh, what is called the strict scrutiny approach in the United States, is that ultimately, judges are going to have to balance. They're going to have to weigh the competing interests. And they're going to have to weigh whether or not we should give protection to the weightier right of tribes to continue performing their religious exercise, or is the weightier interest here the need to protect against 
uh, accidents on the highway. Which of these things is going to receive more weight? And my friend and former colleague, Professor Sharif Gurgis, is uh, writing an article coming out in the Columbia Law Review that argues that this type of balancing is inevitable. This is really, at the end of the day, aside from certain absolute constitutional rights, which we'll talk about more later, there's, there's no other game in town. This is all that courts can do when they're involved in a conflict like this. Globally, this is absolutely the received wisdom under the proportionality model. And in fact, some countries have gone so far to say that uh, not only should the judiciary balance these interests, but really the only branch of government that is involved in protecting constitutional rights is the judiciary. And so the role of the other branches of government is just to push as far as they can and regulate as much as they can. And the judiciary is the constitutional breaks of the system. And that's, that's how it goes. So there's been a, up, an uprising of, uprising is the wrong word. <laughs> we don't want to think about uprising with the election coming up in November. So all right, there has been a, a, an increased concern on, uh, amongst scholars and justices on the Supreme Court about this idea of balancing. Justice Scalia famously said that if a court is trying to compare interests, he, didn't, he wasn't talking about a Native American case, but if they're trying to compare interests, they're often incommensurable. They don't have a, a common criteria against which they can both be measured. And so it's like trying to compare the length of a string to the weight of a rock. There's just not a rational answer to that question. So what you're ultimately doing is just telling the judiciary, just pick. Just subjectively pick the answer that you like in this case. And there's no real way of judging whether there was, would have been a better or worse answer to that question. And there's a lot of difficulty for litigants in advance predicting how that question will go down. And so Justice Kavanaugh, in his concurrence in Ramirez, and recently again in the Rahimi case, has raised concerns about judicial balancing. Justice Gorsuch did as well in a different uh, sort of dormant commerce clause case joined by Justice Barrett. And so there's some concern on the court about, is this really the appropriate role for judges to do this sort of balancing? If it, if it is ultimately just a subjective determination, isn't that better left to the political process? If it is ultimately going to be arbitrary, aren't Shouldn't arbitrary decisions be borne by those who can be politically accountable for them? Uh, so one alternative that has been offered in sort of a reaction to balancing rises out of the text and history discourse that has increased in popularity in the Supreme Court, and uh, particularly a historical analog approach that came out of the Supreme Court's decision in Bruin that has been advocated by Professor Joel Alasea. A similar approach has long been advocated by uh, Professor Hamburger. So what the Supreme Court did in Bruin is it struck down a law that was putting certain limits on people's right to bear arms uh, because the court said that the government there wasn't able to point to an analogous enough regulation that existed at the founding that demonstrated that the government had the right to interfere with a constitutional right in that way. So let me walk you through some questions about how that would shake out in this case. If we go back to the Native American sacred site, what is the relevant historical analog that we're looking for here? Is the analog the fact that at the founding, we know that the, the framers cared a lot about religious liberty, and they protected religious liberty in a lot of contexts, and uh, had laws in place to protect things like objectors from the military or swearing of oaths? Is that the relevant analog? In which case, should the tribal plaintiffs always win? And should the government always lose? Because it's a religious liberty issue, and that's the relevant analog, no matter how many lives could be lost in the construction project. Or, or is the relevant historical analog the fact that since the dawn of our republic, government actors have been destroying and desecrating Native American sacred sites? and have been given very little protection to Native American religious exercise. Does that mean that the tribal plaintiffs should always lose and government should always win, no matter how important this sacred site is to them and how many other options the government has <clears throat> at its disposal? So my concern about this historical analog approach is not that it has no place in our constitutional rights discourse, but if it's the only tool in our toolkit what I think it sets up, us up for is a lot of zero-sum conflicts. 
where we're going to always have a winner or loser that is not really well tailored to the facts at issue in the particular conflict. It doesn't allow much room for nuance. Uh, there's a forthcoming article by Professor Jed Campbell, which I highly recommend, called Determining Rights. Is that still the title? Terrific. Um, and the other concern about this approach is that although it's the text and history approach, it might be getting historical understandings of rights in our country badly wrong. Uh, the framers had some rights that they put in constitutions that were quite specific textually, and maybe even were bringing into being a right <clears throat> that hadn't existed before. And Professor Campbell refers to those as specificatory rights. But there were a lot of rights that were understood as existing as part of the broader natural law. And so when constitutions reference those rights, and certainly our Federal Bill of Rights, probably the default is this was happening. When they reference those rights, they're not creating them. They are putting in place a placeholder that is telling us, yeah, that, that right you all know about that sort of exists in the general law of our country, we want to protect that. We think that that's important. But those rights also often were understood as including within them limitations that were essential to also protecting the common good. They weren't unlimited rights. They weren't rights to run roughshod over all the other sorts of interests in society. And I worry that the historical analog approach doesn't really reflect that sort of understanding of rights at our founding, ironically. Uh, given that it's running under the banner of history. So uh, what I have proposed instead in an article that's forthcoming in the Chicago Law Review called Constitutional Rights as, uh, as, uh, excuse me, Constitutional Rights as Protected Reasons is a different theory of how we can think about constitutional rights. And the criteria we might think about tonight as we're evaluating it and talking about it are both normative justifications for this theory, if we think about the role of a judiciary within a democracy. What is the judiciary competent to do in ways that aren't going to put so much pressure in democracy? And also a theory of rights that is consistent with this sort of historical notion that we needed to have limits on rights, but uh, in a space for our democratic processes to determine rights as well. But if we are thinking of the judiciary as having any sort of role in protecting rights, is there still an important role for them to do that is consistent with that sort of historical understanding. I'm going to put a slide up that's very dense, but then we're going to unpack it. So I argue that conditions for government, actually, let me go to this slide really quick. I think this one's easier. A constitutional right is a protected reason. It, a, a, let's start with a protected reason. Joseph Raz is a philosopher who argued that protected reasons have two elements. First. A protected reason creates a first order element for action, which means just an ordinary run of the mill reason why you might want to do something. But it is paired with an exclusionary reason, which means a reason why some things might not be able to come on the scale at all. So first order reasons get on a scale and then somebody will weigh them. But exclusionary reasons keep some things off the scale. Raz most famously talked about protected reasons in the context of the law. When government actors create law, law is a directive to citizens both to act as a first order reason, put on the scale, the law told you to do it, so you should, but it also acts as an exclusionary reason to keep certain other reasons off the scale. You just can't break the law because you think it's inconvenient or you disagree. That just shouldn't be part of the analysis when you're considering what to do. And in the model I propose, I'm, I'm sort of flipping the direction of protected reasons. So constitution makers are often acting as givers of law or norms to government. So we're telling government, if we've decided to put religious exercise in the constitution, that is a first order reason, that's an important reason why you political actors might want to act to protect this interest. But it's also an exclusionary reason that keeps some things off the scale. We wouldn't let you government uh, interfere with someone's freedom of speech, for example, just because other groups find it highly offensive. It might be you're really weighty. They might feel really strongly that it's offensive. But that sort of reason just doesn't get to come on the scale and be part of the analysis. I do think that uh, the analysis of how this cashes out should be different if we're talking about a facial challenge. So if the relevant uh, government actors who have created the tension with the constitutional right or a legislature, and they have put in the text of the law 
their reasons for interfering with at least the prima facie constitutional right, uh, and those reasons are not excluded, then I think courts should often be pretty hesitant to just discard those. We can see the Supreme Court engaging in this sort of analysis in a case called Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project, where there Congress engaged in some specific findings in their hearings before they passed a new law that prohibited counseling and assistance and teaching to terrorist groups. And Congress made factual findings about ways in which that action uh, basically would provide fungible support that could increase terrorist activity and harm US diplomatic activities. And our court didn't dis disregard that easily. I think that courts have a more important role to play in what's called an as-applied challenge, which is where courts are saying, generally this law, this law that applies to everybody is fine, but this person, the way that it's applying in this context is problematic. These often involved uh, context where government is acting in discretionary ways, its action wasn't required by the law, and where uh, democratic accountability for that political actor might be pretty low. I mean, when Congress engages in findings and passes a law, democratic accountability for that might be at its highest ebb in terms of considering what the reasons were that influenced that legislation, how it's affecting all of us. It's not true if you have an unelected official who's just deciding, based on their discretion, how to apply a law in the books. So part of the analysis in this context that courts are doing is they're making sure that certain reasons are excluded from consideration. They're also asking government, what was your official reason? So tell us. There's, there's a disciplining effect, I think, in government having to say out loud, we want to interfere with this prima facie right for these reasons. Uh, and ideally giving those reasons contemporaneously with whatever the interference was. And the other thing, maybe the most important thing courts are doing, uh, is making sure that these reasons, if they do get to go on the scale, both the prima facie right and some non-excluded reason, are these actually in conflict with one another? Because even if uh, you have dueling first order reasons, there's no reason for one of them to override the other. If, in fact, you could, they're not, it's, not, it's possible to do both. Then you could have what econ economists refer to as a Pareto efficient improvement, whereby you could make one person better off, not at the expense of the other person. And in those contexts, we don't actually have to balance anything. We don't have to have a common criteria against which we're, which we're measuring things. Pareto efficient outcomes overcome the issue of incommensurability. And courts, I think, are often asking that question. So if we go back to the highway widening example, a case where um, the government did, in fact, move forward because it didn't think there was any sort of protection here and did bulldoze this land and cut down these trees and spread the stones of the sacred altar and remove the access. If we were analyzing this under a protected reasons model, so we're asking, keep in mind, this is an as-applied context. It's not a facial context. Because it's not as though a legislature came along and passed a law and said, we're going to demolish a Native American sacred site for these reasons and be politically accountable about it and have to have our feet held to the fire by our constituents about what we're doing. These are just um, government officials who are applying an existing Highway Transportation Act to engage in a highway widening project this way. But the question that they could never ask or never answer on appeal was why they couldn't widen on the other side of the road. They never had an answer to that question. And, and on appeal ultimately conceded that they could have done something like that. So one of the things that a protected reason model would force us to put more pressure on is, were those interests, the government's interest, and the religious exercise, in this case, ever actually in conflict? Or was there an equally effective way that government could have accomplished its interest and had a Pareto efficient outcome that could have protected the tribal interests as well? Uh, certainly, highway safety is an important reason. It's a non-excluded reason. That would go on the scale. But then the government has to demonstrate a conflict. It also has to demonstrate that its actions are actually advancing that interest. And I think this is one of the most important roles for the judiciary when it comes to constitutional right conflicts. How does this differ? Or how would we decide what the excluded reasons are? And it might be that there are some reasons that if we're allowed to count as permissible government interests, they would defeat the constitutional right in every context. 
So if a permissible reason to interfere with a prima facie right were efficiency or convenience, then any government official worth their salt could always argue that there's some efficiency or convenience benefit for their policies, in which case there would have really been no point in constitutionalizing a right. It could be defeated any time government wants it to be. So it might be that there's some set of reasons that just always have to be excluded for a constitutional right ever to mean anything. And often, my own view is that the compelling interest test under strict scrutiny is excluding precisely those sorts of reasons. It also, the compelling interest test often excludes um, issue, the interest in cost savings. So cost, government could always save some more money if it interfered with constitutional rights. There's a book by um, Sunstein and Larson, I believe, that, that, that the title is The Cost of Rights. And it talks about how rights are costly. We, we take that cost into account when we decide to memorialize an interest in the Constitution. We are taking on costs as a society because we think that the benefits to society for constitutional rights are worth it. And so there is a, a cost-benefit analysis that is happening, but it's happening on the front end. It shouldn't be happening on the judicial end. Um, I also think that uh, one way in which you might find that some reasons are excluded or some reasons are allowed is you could look at history. You could see which sort of reasons seem to be a permissible reason to interfere with this prima facie right. That's something that the Supreme Court did, for example, in Rahimi. Uh, Justice Barrett and the majority both talk about how a government's desire to remove weapons from the hands of someone who is a domestic abuser or who's been found to be violent that is a reason why we would say it's legitimate, it's permissible, it's not excluded for government to interfere with that constitutional right. So history might tell us these sorts of reasons are permissible. I think uh, ju just about every scholar agrees that something like safety, like physical safety, saving human lives, should be a reason why prima facie rights can be interfered with, including rights like religious exercise. So this, in the highway widening example, an interest like safety would count, that would go on the scale. But the difference between the theory I'm proposing and the historical analog approach is that Professor Alisea, and as far as I understand, Justice Kavanaugh, would not just look to history for the reason why we might limit the right, but also the method. So unless we can find an analog of this particular method, then we're not gonna allow government to interfere with the right. I think that's a real problem because unless, for, take the Second Amendment for example, unless we are going to say that the constitutional right only applies to sabers and muskets, if we expand what the right applies to but we don't also let the government make factual determinations, politically accountable determinations about methods it needs to accomplish that reason, a reason based in history, then we are tying the hands of our democratic process, a process that is necessary to think about how we're going to determine rights in ways that both give them weighty protection, remove some reasons from the calculus for protecting them, but also recognize important countervailing interests that are sometimes in conflict with those rights and necessary to protect uh, to, protect, to advance public interests. This sort of theory would provide a different defense of strict scrutiny. It would think of strict scrutiny in this way rather than a freewheeling balancing enterprise. It could potentially root it in history. And there are early cases, uh, including in 1813, People versus Phillips, and 1830, Cronin coming out of New York, dealing with religious exercise, where courts are asking these sorts of questions. So in People versus Phillips, there we had a Catholic priest who was being subpoenaed because he had received a confession from a criminal who had talked to the Catholic priest about stealing a necklace. He was a burglar. And so the government wanted to force the Catholic priest to testify about this. Um, the government was arguing its reason, its justification for interfering with this constitutional right was that it needed to reduce crime. and it. Uh, it, having the Catholic priest's testimony would accomplish that goal. So it's interesting. The court in this case talks about how reducing crime seems like a good thing. And they uh, agree with the government about the importance of that. But they point out that the government can't just say, can't just assert without any evidence that protecting 
the Catholic priest's religious exercise here, which they recognize as an important sacrament for the Catholic priest, they can't just say that protecting that would necessarily interfere with crime. They have to demonstrate that. And in this case, the court said, we're skeptical that, in fact, your actions are advancing the interest you propose in the way that you suggest here. We're, we're worried that this outcome would be a ticket good for this ride only. Once criminals find out that all of their confessions are then going to be subject to testimony in court, they'll just stop confessing to their priests. And then the court said something it probably wouldn't say today, and it said, and if that happens, crime might go up if no more criminals are confessing to their religious leaders. Uh, and they also point out there are other areas in the law where we exempt people from testifying. And there are special relationships where we don't force testimony, which suggests that maybe these things aren't in conflict like you say that they are. Seems like in other areas of the law, we're willing to provide special protection for these sorts of relationships. And somehow you still are able to fight crime. And so that court in New York didn't rule for the government, ruled for protecting religious exercise, asking the same sorts of questions that I think we would be better served asking under this constitutional rights as protected reasons approach. So with that, I'm happy to pause and take questions. So I'll just encourage you to cue at the mics. I think they are working, but please hold the mic close to your mouth and speak as loudly as you feel comfortable speaking. Hi, Professor. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. It's been fascinating. Um, how would your approach deal with level of generality problems where maybe the government in this case could have justified or maybe in reality the government's safety interest is actually an efficiency interest where they want to prevent like backups on the highway and so they want a turn off lane and so at some level maybe every reason could become like a reason that should be excluded um, in your framework. How would you handle that problem? I do think that efficiency and safety are different in kind. Like I don't think if you go high enough, high enough up on the level of generality you, you, that somehow at some point necess necessarily crosses over into efficiency. Um, I'll talk about cost in a minute, which might be more related to that. But let me first say that one issue with level of generality that the historical analog approach faces, that I think any sort of rights theory faces, is uh, a bigger problem when you have categorical protections for rights than if you have something looking like strict scrutiny. And so I'm not saying that it's insurmountable. There might be evidence when it comes to some categorical rights, which I think should exist, including in areas like the Establishment Clause, where maybe we're trying to look to history to tell us what's going to be the more relevant level of generality. But it's a hard question. Uh, it's, ironically, it is a criticism, though, that defenders of the historical analog approach have leveled at strict scrutiny. And I think it's more their problem than this one. And here's why in the strict scrutiny context is because if government is also subject to an evidentiary burden, where it has to demonstrate that its actions are advancing its interest, and that its interest is in conflict with, like there's not a less restrictive means, it's in conflict with the constitutional right, then the government's going to think carefully about its level of generality it will assert. Because if it's going too high or too low, it's going to be under-inclusive. It's not going to be able to meet an evidentiary burden of demonstrating that it's actually advancing its interests. So a lot of that, the government is going to have to think about hard on the front end. Uh, so I'm, I'm sort of outsourcing it and saying, OK, well, what courts often do is say, OK, government, this is the level of generality you have articulated. Can you back it up? Uh, when it comes to something like cost, it's possible that some constitutional rights, at least right now under strict scrutiny, the court has um, suggested that cost is an excluded reason. It's not a compelling reason. But it's possible that at some point, cost might pass a threshold where it becomes no longer just a cost issue, but a safety issue. We haven't ever seen a case where that happened. My experience is that constitutional rights generally aren't that costly to protect. But it's hypothetically possible. Um, does that require balancing? Does that require at some point we're saying, well, is the cost so much that we can't justify the religious exercise? That would lead us right back to the problems that I was talking about. You might avoid that sort of problem uh, if you just had 
a threshold that was static for cost. And then you're not balancing your sorting. Um, and so, for example, the Federal Highway Administration has decided that the cost for protecting a human life is $12.5 million. How do they come up with that number? I don't know. Uh, but that's in the regulations. And so hypothetically, we could have a threshold like that, at which point, if you're above it, it's no longer a cost issue. It's a human life issue. It seems arbitrary, but that we could say it was arbitrary, but it was politically decided. It wasn't, wasn't just made up by the courts, and maybe more importantly, the amount of cost doesn't need to change based on the value or weight of the constitutional right, which would never be an answer we would know in advance. Um, it would always be in a flex. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, hi. Thank you so much for the talk. So what are your thoughts of this framework applying to the last case of Jay Bhattacharya, who was a professor at Stanford, who it was decided on the standing issues, not on the merits, but essentially the whole issue about the government using its power to bully social media companies into silence, which was not decided on the merits, but was decided on the standing issues, and how this whole thing applied to that situation. And so tell me more about the facts of that case. Yeah, the, the case was that uh, the, federal uh, so the federal government had used its power to suggest uh, social media companies like LinkedIn, Facebook, to censor particular experts on uh, public policy. One of them was a Stanford professor, Jay Bajataria, who was mm -hmm. promoting an alternative view to, well, actually, based on his own expertise, he was anti-lockdowns, and he promoted the so-called Gary Barrington Declaration, and that was uh, heavily censored by the social media companies. On the suggestion, and again, there was a lot of argument in, on the suggestion of the federal government, and, the, and again, the case was not decided on the merits, was decided on the standing issue that Professor Bacchisaria didn't have a standing in that, but they didn't get into the merits of it. Yeah, so without being deep in the weeds in that case, it also reminds me some of the court's decision in net choice. Yes, but, uh, it was some, related, but it was different. It was a different yeah, some of what is going on in these cases is also a question that exists on the front end, which is, does the relevant activity even fall within the realm of the prima facie constitutional right? Uh, so is this expression, is this First Amendment protected activity at all? Does that get to go on the scale on the front end? I'm just saying that was part of the question at issue in NetChoice. Is, is what social media companies are doing, is editorial um, in the way that they're presenting speech? A little different than what you're talking about. So uh, one thing that I will note is I think those questions are really hard, and sometimes it's underdeterminate what is going to answer it. It's not a question that my theory, so if, we're, if you're thinking of like the, the red line on the left, mm -hmm. the question of does this get to go on the scale at all as a prima facie constitutional right, um, my theory doesn't make that any easier or any harder than in, any other theory. It's, I'm changing more what happens on the back end once that has gone on the scale, and also giving more thought to the deference we should give to political actors when they decide to protect constitutional rights. So to follow up, do you think that the answer should be reforming Section 230 or similar to say, hey, explicitly what the government can tell to the social media companies? My article doesn't have any view on that. OK, so, but, thank you. Yeah, good <laughs> question. Sorry. That's the first time in my life I've been too tall for something. OK. Um, I've, so, I've never had that problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, I had, I was hoping you could maybe, oh, first of all, thanks for the talk. This is really interesting um, and really exciting to see jurisprudential views being applied to like live constitutional problems. So that's very cool. Um, I was hoping you could help me see how your view does better than the um, than the, the the balancing view with respect to the sort of like the, the Scalia like, oh no, we're just deciding out of thin air problem. Um, and so as I'm remembering my RAS and like it's been a minute, but you know, a legitimate legal authority gives me a command that creates a secondary reason which excludes all like primary reasons except for the, the reason that it's like legal, that it's like legally guiding, right? And so that's helpful because I know if I'm following the legitimate legal order, like the, the only primary reason I have to act is that it's the law, right? But I'm kind of wondering in this view where the constitutional right creates a protected reason that excludes some but not everything right so it's going to exclude efficiency and you know or it's going to exclude you know um really silly things like we like the aesthetic of wide roads but it might not exclude 
other kinds of reasons, right? Mm -hmm. But the Constitution itself doesn't give us any guidance on what those non-excluded for shorter reasons are for acting. And so it seems like what the judiciary is having to uh, battle with a lot is figuring out what gets to go into that bucket of things that are, that are legitimate to decide. And as you noted in these history cases, we're, you know, they're arguing back and forth. Like we, we could maybe view what they're doing as really arguing back and forth about what things do and don't fall into that bucket. And so how do I know that when they're figuring out what things are and are not screened off by the constitutional reason, that they're also not just picking, that they're not just sort of having to decide at the last minute, like, ah, this seems like the kind of thing that the Constitution should screen off, and ah, this seems like the kind of thing the Constitution shouldn't screen off. And for me, I'm worried that that kind of gets us back to the Scalia, the Scalia balancing problem. Um, and so if you can help me see, like, how we know which first order reasons are the ones getting screened off and not screened off, that'd be really helpful. Yeah. Let me give you the short answer to that question, and then I'll give you the long answer. Great, thanks. The short answer is under a balancing approach, there are no easy answers. Under my approach, there will still be hard cases, but there are some easy answers. So uh, let me back up a little bit to your question, which I think is a really good one. How do we decide which reasons are excluded? Actually, let me back up before that. Some of Raz's writing suggests he thought that the law excluded all reasons, but other of his writings suggest that um, an exclusionary reason did not exclude all reasons, and maybe even there might be some really, 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 uh, there might be some non-excluded reasons to break the law. Uh, but also, exclusionary reasons don't also operate just in the context of the law. Another famous area is promises, right? And Ulrika um, has written about how some reasons to break promises might be in, others might be out. So my, my approach here of trying to figure out which reasons are in or out under an exclusionary reason is not totally new. It's not the effect that exclusionary reasons must exclude everything. Though well, they can. A constitutional right becomes absolute if it excludes, excludes all reasons. Two other answers of the, we do have at least one constitutional right in the text of our Constitution that lists an exclusionary reason, and that is the takings clause. So it tells us the reason that is permitted to, you have to give just compensation for this public purpose. So it's basically a permitted, non-excluded reason that comes with a fee, right? Keep in mind, I'm also proposing this model to a global audience. It's part of my PhD at Oxford. And a lot of constitutions actually do list the reasons that you can interfere with a constitutional right, which I think is interesting. Maybe a good way to write constitutions. More modern ones do. Now, what does that still say about rights like ours, right that, rights that might be declaratory, as Professor Campbell has written about? And so the, the reasons are, exist historically, but we don't have them written down. Is, is it just as subjective for the judiciary to identify those as it would be for the judiciary to balance? I don't think so, and here's why. Because once the judiciary has said, like in Rahimi, taking away weapons, from people who have been found to be violent, like a domestic abuser, is a non-excluded reason. We're not going to relitigate that anymore. So we know in every future case that if the government is litigating on that basis, it's just a factual question. Is the government policy closely enough linked to that reason or not? Or not? Um, same with religious exercise cases. If you know that public safety is not excluded and there's enough evidence of that, which uh, a lot of scholars point to the fact that it was included in most of the state constitutions that did write down non-excluded reasons and often included things like health and public safety. So if we've, we've taken on board and said that that's a non-excluded reason, we just know that in every case moving forward. And there will be a lot of cases where the government is claiming one of those interests. So we don't have to have a big litigation or fight about whether the government is claiming some newfangled thing and whether that counts or not. And the government just can't factually back it up. But there's going to be no predictability like that if, if in every case we're asking, is the safety bad enough compared to the importance of this religious exercise that we can justify government interfering here? Great, thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, first off, for being here. I love your lecture. I'm glad the weather allowed you to actually come this time. Me too. Uh, my question is about kind of a distinction between a layperson will talk about freedom of speech, 
or freedom of religion. Mm. But a legal, legal scholar is more likely to use phrases like constitutionally protected speech or constitutionally protected exercise of religion. And I'm wondering, um, what is lost or gained when we switch from one way of referring to these things to the other things? Are they completely different ideas? Or, or is, yeah, what, what's lost or gained if lawyers or politicians or media people are talking about constitutionally protected speech rather than freedom of speech? I think it's a great question. I actually think that that sort of rhetoric that you sometimes hear in the media that the court allowed the government to violate their freedom of speech, I think that that's problematic because it suggests that we do have these rights, but sometimes the government gets to run amok over them, which I think pits rights against the public interest or the common good in a way that makes them more adversarial um, and also makes rights seem uh, sort of less definitive. Like sometimes your rights will get violated and sometimes they won't, as opposed to if we think about a right in a more uh, nuanced way and think you have the right for the government not to interfere with activity that's falling within this zone of the prima facie right other than for permitted reasons that the government can back up factually. And so if the government can demonstrate those things, your right hasn't been violated. Your right never included that, that scope of activity. It's, it's harder to get that across in a soundbite on a TikTok reel, right? But I think that that sort of framing and thinking really does more to bring rights into part of the larger public interest of the community. So there are some rights, some activity that is so important to us as a society that constitution makers decided we're going to take some reasons and maybe all reasons off the scale because we want this interest protected in durable ways across time and across society. And we have seen in history that government often has bad reasons for interfering with this interest. And so we're going to take away a lot of those bad reasons. And that will actually ultimately in the long run make society better, promote more of the public interest or the common good. And so rights in that way are contributing to the overall benefit for our entire society. And I think that sort of rhetoric is more accurate uh, and is what some of this is trying to push. Uh, and I think it makes it better than for, to think of rights constantly being violated by the political process. And this, also this idea that the political process, their job is to interfere with rights as much as the judiciary will let them. I think we need to shift that framing. Great question. Hi, Professor. Uh, thank you for your lecture. I'm curious about uh, the theoretical or practical difference between your approach and uh, Dawkins' tri uh, right as Trump, uh -huh. and uh, which argue that the right cannot be overridden by the interest. And it seems to me similar to your uh, approach because you also argue that the rights as a protected reason can like uh, exclude other reasons to, 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 to the claim or to the rights. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so Dworkin was famously, it's a great question. He was pretty vague about what exactly he meant as rights being Trump's, uh, and when they could be overridden and when they couldn't. Um, he, tell, he tells us that it shouldn't be a bare consequentialist approach, but sometimes he makes it sound like, but we're still balancing. It's just that rights are really heavy, so you have to have a really reason to override rights. Joseph Raz famously said about Dworkin that he has told us nothing new or interesting about rights other than they can't be overridden except when they can, and that's all we know by the time we're done reading his theory. Um, and Dworkin himself sometimes talked about how when you're deciding whether or not to override rights, it is based on a comparison. So like, is the interest weighty enough compared to what the right is doing? And that to me, suggest that that is quintessential balancing. So Dworkin can, can be read different ways, but uh, the approach that I'm suggesting wouldn't allow an excluded reason to come on the scale um, because at some point its value is more important than the countervailing uh, constitutional interest. Those things are never put in relation to each other. I don't think they should be. I don't think they need to be. And in that way, I differ from Dworkin. And hopefully, hopefully, I'm a little bit more clear about what I'm advocating for, too. Do you want to ask a question? Oh, I couldn't tell if you were raising your hand. Aiden? Uh, 
Hi. Is this on? Can you hear me? OK, yeah. great. Thanks so much for being here. Really enjoyed the talk. Um, as everybody has said, clearly it was very successful and popular among us. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to ask That's so far... That's just what you're saying when you get to the mics, but... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so far, we've been talking about an issue where there's tension between a government interest and a constitutional right. I'm wondering if your model bears any weight on those situations where you feel like the government is actually interested in expanding or pushing upon um, a constitutional floor or constitu constitutional ceiling. I'm thinking... Um, for example, about the Restoration of Religious Freedom Act and the City of Bernie case, mm -hmm. where um, the legislature is interested in actually pushing beyond what the court recognized as a constitutional, uh, as the definition of a constitutional right. So, in those instances, do you think that the pr protected reason model bears any weight in the reverse, or is it limited to just those cases where there's tension between the two? Does that make sense? Yeah. No, I, I'm wondering if you if you read my article, because that is something that I'm writing about. So it's a great question. But uh, so I didn't have the time to talk about this in my opening remarks. But one of the things that I think is important in terms of like a separation of power element to the first order reason that goes on the scale is that it does provide a justification for politically accountable actors, I think, to give weight to constitutional rights. And this is something Michael McConnell has argued about, and I think he's right. We would be in a pretty sorry place as a country if we really took on board the view that the job of political actors is to run roughshod over rights as much as the judiciary will let them, and that that's their job. I think it's a really good thing when politically accountable actors decide to enact legislation because they want to protect constitutional rights. One example of this, again, in the, the Native American context, is our federal government has created what's called um, well, I'll talk about the religious exercise first. Some tribal tribes use uh, eagle feathers in some of their ceremonies, eagle, eagle feathers that were molted in the wild. They wouldn't kill an eagle to get the feathers, but if they find feathers in the forest or an eagle has died of natural causes, then they will use those feathers. They're very sacred for ceremonies. You can imagine why, though, the government has concerns about just letting people collect eagle feathers and, and not... Uh, keeping an eye on that, given incentives that might provide for non-tribal members, but for other groups to kill or harm eagles. So what the government did is they created a repository of federal eagle feathers that are just found by government workers when they're doing their job. And then they make these available to tribal members so that they can perform their ceremonies and uh, this important function that these feathers fulfill in a way that is still going to accomplish the government's interests. No court told the federal government to do that. I don't think a court could have thought of that or been creative that have to do that. And I think that's a great example of ways in which political actors who put serious weight on the scale of the fact that a right has been constitutionalized then have reason, justification, to do extra things to protect that right. And we are better off as a nation when government does that. What I think sometimes our, where our court has gone astray is they have had cases where rhetoric in those cases sounds kind of territorial, where it's like, well, it's our job, the courts, to protect rights. And you, government, stay hands off. And so one of the most egregious examples of this is the one you mentioned, City of Bernie, where after the Supreme Court, in a decision in 1990 called Employment Division versus Smith, said, we think that the protection for religious exercise should be much lower. They, they were saying, we shouldn't protect groups like Native Americans in that case. Congress just three years later responded with a nearly unanimous piece of legislation, the uh, Religious Freedom Restoration Act, and said, no, we, like, fine if you want to have a low judicial floor, but we would like to have a higher congressional ceiling, and we want to make sure that we are um, only interfering with religious exercise for really important, compelling reasons. So we want to exclude a lot of reasons for the scale, from the scale, and when religious exercise is interfered with, we want that to trigger protection. And the court responded and basically said there were, there were a number of different things. Some of it had to do with federalism concerns. Um, but part of the rhetoric of that decision was like, it's our job as the court to define constitutional rights. And we have said that this is the floor, and we're also simultaneously making it a ceiling, and you, Congress, can't go beyond that. Um, so I think that is like the opposite of what my approach would argue for. And I think courts should be pretty deferential, pretty... Um, wary to overturn 
determinations by political actors that are meant to give meaning to our rights. And uh, we're better off as a country where if Congress or some sort of other legislature decided to put a lot of weight on the scale for that constitutional right, that courts are pretty hesitant to undo that. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Um, so I'm interested in uh, two things, but maybe they're kind of related. And I guess the core of the question is like, how different is this from proportionality? Mm -hmm. So the two things are, um, first, how do you think about the scalar dimension of the government's interest? So you've been sort of treating this as yes, no, uh, the interest is either in or out, but you could imagine thinking about the government's interest as being defined as harm over a certain degree. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's some point at which cost does, I mean, I teach this to my students, there's some like trillions of dollars of cost is going to be a compelling, savings is going to be a compelling interest. Mm -hmm. um, there is some degree of public safety that's going to be trivially s small in character, right? Like somebody getting nudged or something on the subway is not something that is worth trying to prevent. So so that that's one dimension of it. But then the, the kind of flip side dimension of it is why consider the constitutional right, like the left side of the scale? By the way, I think you need to hold that a little closer. Oh, sorry. Why treat the left side as one thing as opposed to like a million different things that are grouped together under a thing called religious liberty. So religious liberty is just a, a term that is used to embrace thousands upon thousands of different types of religious acts. And why wouldn't we then think about the way in which this scale, the I mean, I realize you're not proposing a balancing test, but like the excluded reasons or non-excluded reasons are sufficient for governmental uh, efforts to uh, reimpose the Inquisition as opposed to governmental efforts to interfere with re religious liberty in some other way, right? So there might be an inhibition on worship. There might be an in inhibition on the government's ability to manage its own property and so on. And why, like, why not think about those as just different manifestations of religious liberty that actually call for different excluded or included reasons. And once you do that, like on the front, on the left side and on the right side, I wonder how much, when this becomes like very highly tailored, you aren't basically replicating balancing. So let me take your second question first, because I want to make sure I understand it. I think we agree. So I, I don't think that that little bubble on the left represents religious liberty wholesale. I think there are retail aspects of rights. Like rights have a lot of different manifestations of them. And so we, what I'm really asking is, does this particular activity fall within the zone of some prima facie constitutional right? And it, I think it is the case that when you have a declaratory right that is listed in the Bill of Rights and it's a placeholder for something, it is a placeholder for something that is multifaceted and it has a lot of different elements to it. And it might also be the case that as you break out those elements and look at them hard, that not all of them have the same exclusionary reasons. So to the extent the ministerial exception, and for those of you who aren't familiar with that, let's say that we root that in, just in religious exercise, although I think it has an establishment element to it too. Well, just for sake of discussion, let's say that's also coming from the religious exercise clause. Um, that element of the right, the court has found, excludes all reasons. So there's something different that's happening with that element of the right than if it's just sort of like a generic, you know, I would like to worship in this space sort of a thing. So it sounds like we actually agree about that. And so then your question is, if you're being nuanced about that, is that any better than balancing? Is that basically the second question? I, I just, I, I do think that it's the case. Part of what motivated this project is um, the critiques of strict scrutiny that all it is is free willing balancing, which may or may not be more accurate of what's going on in the Second Amendment litigation context. I know, I, I don't know. They just didn't ring true to me of how litigation in the free exercise context or the First Amendment context go. That doesn't seem like the question that courts are really 
asking under strict scrutiny in those contexts. And maybe more pointedly, I don't think it's the question courts have to ask. It is not inevitable. It is not required if we're going to have some sort of prima facie right that at some point can be overridden, that the only way to override that right is through balancing. And I do think that there's quite a bit of predictability that comes from knowing what a threshold is in a way that doesn't move. I mean, Paul Clement is on this side of the right thinking about certain garden variety of religious exercise, at what point has it been substantially burdened under RIFRA? He's argued that Yoder answers that question, that if it's a penalty above $5 criminally, you're in. We know that that at least is a threshold. And that threshold isn't moving. It doesn't become you know, a $100 penalty for some claimants and a $2 uh, penalty for other claimants. So it's fine grained, but it's predictable uh, in a way that balancing never would be. So I'm not saying that there's not hard cases, and I'm not saying that there's not nuance. Uh, but I do think that the, the court seems more institutionally competent to answer those first sorts of questions. Your second one about cost at some point getting high enough. Just repeat for me again really quick, Judd. What? Yeah, so on the uh, governmental interest side, it seems like virtually every reason when escalated to a large enough scale to be understood as non-excluded. And so I just, I wonder whether that itself is just a sort of form of proportionality analysis. Oh, yeah, you asked how is it different than proportionality. So, and this is another answer to my question about how is my approach different to a Dworkinian approach. Dworkin would say that. He would say every interest at some level will be weighty enough, at which point it just looks like you're just like putting a heavier thumb on the scale in favor of all these interests. So maybe we start at a different level, but you're still going to ultimately let them all override. Um, my answer is twofold, one of which is that uh, what Dworkin is doing is, again, putting those in relation with something else. So it might be that Again, cost is always going to cost a th cross a th certain threshold. But if that threshold doesn't change depending on the value of the right, then you're not balancing. But the second thing is I don't think that every interest that is excluded will cross a magic threshold at some point. So I think some constitutional rights, like freedom of speech, um, can be understood as excluding offending people. I know there are some exceptions under incitement or fighting words. I don't think that's the best way to think of them as primarily about offense. But just assume with me, for the sake of discussion, that offense should be an excluded reason in that constitutional context. To me, that's the type of reason that like, there's never a threshold where it's offensive enough that we should say, you've, you've crossed over, and now it's a non-excluded reason. So my approach would say some reasons are just always off the scale, and there is no threshold at which now we can bring it on the scale. Thank you. Um... A lot of this seems, or basically all of it seems to be about the interaction of political actors with constitutionally protected rights. And I was wondering if it matters which political actors we're talking about, and if it does, how. So if we care if it's a law, or an executive order, or agency guidelines, or even just sort of the practice of an executive agency, and whether these bodies get to use different sorts of reasonings or justifications, or to different degrees. Yeah, I think it's a really important question. It's one that I'm thinking about more. I think the legislature is easy on one side of the scale, where we're sort of peak democratic accountability. I think an unelected government official who isn't passing like a rule or regulation, but is just applying law in the books in a discretionary way, to me, is sort of the other side of the scale. Uh, I think it's hard to think about if democracy is a normative criteria. It's, it's hard and hotly debated right now how agencies fit into that, uh, in part because there are things that uh, have happened in our own constitutional system that have made agencies less accountable to the legislature. The Supreme Court's decision in Chadha comes to mind. So there's a lot of debate right now among scholars about whether or not agencies are more accountable than having courts rigorously try and interpret what they're doing consistent with the legislature. Uh, for purposes of this paper, I don't wade into that. I think that might have to be a future project to, th to think harder about the relationship between religious exercise or constitutional rights and the administrative state. But right now, especially where the administrative state is in a state of flux after Loper, we're sort of figuring out what's going on with some of that. Um, I'm bracketing that very important, hard question. Any other questions? 
Um, sorry to report that we we're at time, but uh, let's uh, all join uh, thanking Stephanie. Um, Thank you.